Hey there. Welcome to First Look. Thanks for being here this week. Uh, it's raining. It's a little cooler. Uh, we had one more unprecedented situation that happened over the weekend. <laughs> and uh, I think we're all just kind of, we're all just kind of going with the flow. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what happens now. I don't know what happens uh, in like an hour, but you know, we're all just, we're all just living in the moment at this point. I think that's what it teaches me, is whatever you think is happening, give it a minute and we'll figure out, you know, what happens after that. Um, so I'm, in, I'm fascinated by the world that I live in, and I guess that's a good thing. So this week, um, we're at the end of a series, and uh, we talked about legacy and the, um, like, what David was trying to kind of set up for himself and know about himself and uh, the relationship that he has with this new person on the scene, at least for us, in the prophet Nathan. And so now we move from that story to one that I think you, you probably know pretty well, and we're ending in kind of this big splash kind of moment, um, which is tragic, and um, I, but I think also kind of speaks to part of the journey that David's on. We could certainly continue on. I could be doing, I could be doing a series on David for the entire year. I mean, there's enough material in scripture for us to do that and to, and to really get a lot from it. But I had to stop somewhere. And so I thought the end of the month was a good place to stop. And one of the things that um, I've been kind of working through is when, how did David, how did this story, not just David, but Saul, Samuel, um, Nathan, Jonathan, how do all these relationships kind of represent who we are? Not just the person of David, or the person of Samuel, but the relationships, uh, which is a slightly different, I realize it's a subtle change from other things I could be doing, but that's what I was working on. And so I've kept looking at how, not just, for instance, not just how Saul kind of thinks about Saul's self, but how Saul and David, how their relationship, or Jonathan and David, or whoever, what that says about the ways that I tend to be with other people, I, how I tend to interact with the world, how I see the world, how I see God. Um, you know, because we see we see the world through the context of the people around us. And that's what I see here. So in this last week before we pivot, we're talking about, um, the, the sermon title is toxic. And I think that's a word that we have used to describe people much more often than maybe we used to. I mean, I think, you know, toxic meant like a Mr. Yuck sticker whenever I was a kid. But now, you know, we talk about it often as kind of a, a way of describing the way that someone is in the world. And we talked a little bit about narcissism uh, several weeks ago. We weren't really talking about narcissism. Um, we were using it as sort of an example to talk about something else. Um, but I think um, the sort of toxic traits that we see in people is, I think, an important way for us to understand how we relate to folks. Because I think I came from a generation, I'm like, uh, generationally, I'm like right on the cusp of being either Gen X or Millennial, depending on where you see 1980 falling on that spectrum. Um, you know, I have big boomer parents and uh, greatest generation grandparents and um, you know, the world that I knew uh, in many ways is similar, but it has changed in obvious ways too. And, but I think one of the things that we talk about much differently now, I think, I could be wrong, you can tell me, is that 
people who are Gen X, Millennial, um, I think are much more inclined to, especially with their families, um, but with their friends and with their extended world, right, with the people around them, are much more willing to say, that's not a trait that I can be around. I don't care who you are. Um, I'm only going to allow people in my life who are uplifting. And I think that if we were taught, you know, I, I, to kind of understand that, like, now people are people, and you just have to, like, what people do isn't as important as who they are in terms of like, their relationships. So, like, if your uncle's like that, okay, we'll just learn to kind of be with it. Um, and I don't know that that's the case. Now, there's good things and bad things about that. You know, there's healthy things about saying, I'm not going to allow toxic people in my life, especially if they're abusive. Um, if, if they tear you down, you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Um, but, you know, I, I think it also means that you know, we need to be able to work on our relationships too. You know, there's that's the other side of it is that like, hey, you you have these traits. I need to be willing to have conversations with you that are healthy, which is a little bit of what we talked about this past week. Um, and I think a calling to have hard conversations that are ultimately healthy, um, because avoidance. I don't think is a good thing. I think when we avoid telling people, hey, you're being, you're being awful in this situation, and I need to talk to you about it. I can't just look the other way, or I can't just not care about that, um, because your actions speak loudly. And so the story that we're going to see, I think, is such an overt example that I, I don't think we have to look at the subtleties that define what's toxic in it. I think we just have to use it as sort of a, you know, a stepping stone. Use it as a springboard to talking about, you know, how we deal with that in our lives. So, um, the passage is 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 through 15. And this is Samuel and um, Bathsheba. And obviously, what we're going to see in this story is this very powerful dynamic between the two of them, where David is 98% the person who is responsible for what's happened. Bathsheba has about percent maybe involved but the amount of power the amount of power that, that David has it is so overwhelming um, and you know and that's a big part of it is you know what did he do with power what did we see people do with power what do they what are they like what people are like in power how they treat other people, how they talk about other people, how they embrace other people, tells you a lot about them. In similar ways that grief will tell you what someone's like. When everything is nice and fine and um, polite, you know, you can get along with almost anybody, which is how we allow those uncles or whoever in our lives to kind of exist, because we see them at cookouts, or we see them at Christmas, or whatever, and we kind of allow it to just be okay. Um, but in reality, you know, that's, that's just not the case. It, it shouldn't be, that we just allow that to happen in our life. And we don't know how to have conversations that are healthy, and that's a problem too. And so, you know, there's a really, as much a dramatic a story as this is, it really does have, I think, a lot of practical implications for the way we live all the time. Family dynamics, um, in-law dynamics, um, 
family, like friend dynamics, work dynamics, school dynamics, uh, church dynamics. The church is the big one, right? What toxic traits do we allow to just sort of exist? That's a big part of it. So that's what I'd like to talk about here in this town. So, uh, chapter 11. In the spring of that year, the time when kings go out to battle, I like the way you call it that, David sent Joab with his officers and all of Israel with him, and they ravaged the Am Ammonites, Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house and he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to inquire about the woman and it was reported this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was, now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, "I am pregnant." So David sent word to Joab, "Send me Uriah the Hittite." And Joab sent Uriah the Hittite to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and they followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and did not go down to his house. And they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house. David said to Uriah, You have come from the journey. Why did you not go to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark of and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of the Lord are camping in an open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your souls live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow and I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. And on the next day David had invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening he went out and lie on his couch with the servant of the Lord that he did not go down to his house. morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And the letter he wrote set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fight, and then draw back him so that he may be struck down and die. I think if you're looking what makes David a difficult person to understand. I think this is certainly as prominent a one as the other. And I think I misspoke for before. Uh, I said 98% of this is on David and maybe 2% is on Bathsheba. It's 100%. It's 100% on David. And Bathsheba is has absolutely no game in this story whatsoever. I think that you can't read that and not struggle with it. And I think that this story is one of those things that, that you know, when we talk about struggling with it, those are struggling with how we talk about the Bible. Or if you were having trouble with the Bible, you read the story and you realize that David is sort of, um, well, he has this eternal legacy and, you know, compassionate and, or he's thought of compassionately, thought of, he's thought of with great honor, you know, and all those things. And you would say, well, what about the story? 
Now, on one hand, you have the, the idea that, like, no one is perfect, right? This is a pretty awful thing to do. Like, this doesn't go into the, well, you know, simple kind of mistakes that many people make. This is a plot to not only deceive someone else, but then to have them killed, to get them out of the way. It's as awful and toxic a story as I think it is awful. And I, I think it's one of those things that reminds us, at least it reminds me, that scripture, by and large, I guess you could say, except with everyone except for Jesus, that you don't look at what they say or what they do as a hundred percent. Well, that's how the way I'm supposed to be. That you take each story, each lesson, as a, what do I do with the information from? You know, Moses killed someone. And, you know, you have, so it's like you have these stories where not everyone in the story is not only, like, imperfect, but it's dramatically flawed and awful in many ways. And what I think I really appreciate about the story is that at no point does it get buried. I mean, think about writing scripture. Wouldn't you want to write holy scripture in a way that would only highlight the, the really palatable things? That's not what scripture does. It tells you the story. It says who this is. That God uses this person for good things. It doesn't mean he shouldn't be held accountable. It doesn't mean that something else in some other system wouldn't have happened differently. You know, uh, David's the king. He's not, you know, he's not an elected official. He's not a whatever. I mean, he's like, you know, someone who's the king. So the rules are different. So the king. But that's not an excuse for their behavior. And I think that we kind of, we start to generalize toxic traits. I mean, I think that's maybe a big part of the sermon, is that we tend to generalize toxic behavior. Well, everybody does it. Well, everybody's kind of like this. Which, in some ways, makes everything kind of okay, but also keeps toxic traits in place keeps us sort of being okay with, oh, that person is like that. I guess it's okay because everybody is, right? If everyone's terrible, then no one's terrible. And even if you're this amount of terrible, and I'm this amount of terrible, then all you have to be able to say is, oh, well, everyone's terrible. And so then it just, it completely nullifies everything. You know, this person over here is way more terrible. And, and I think that's the part of it. It's sort of the, like, that we make everything relative. Well, everything's like everything else. You know, it's like that kind of, kind of a thing. And you know, everything is like everything else. Some people are just much worse. They act much worse. Now, all that is to say, there's a difference between grace for everything. And it doesn't mean that someone shouldn't be shown grace. You know, and I think that's the other part of like, the argument that like, well, shouldn't we be gracious? Yes, you've made a mistake. Yes, you've done awful things. Um, are you, you know, are you sorry for those? You know, do you see the person being sorry for those things, repentant? You know, taking responsibility. If you don't see them taking responsibility, then that's a whole other ballgame. And you know, people like that in your life who don't take responsibility for anything. Everything is okay. Everything is well. Somebody else's fault. It's always somebody else's fault. So, having 
God having grace for people is not the same as you and I holding them accountable to something. That is different. Because people's actions damage other people. You know, there are the kinds of mistakes that you can make that only really hurt you. But then there are the kinds of mistakes that hurt lots of people. And make everyone around you feel unsafe. Make you feel like you can't be yourself. That you're not okay. And I think that struggling with that and recognizing it, I think, is important. And, you know, one of the things we talked about, we just had vacation Bible school last week. We talked about being heroes. The theme was heroes. Which was a lot of fun. They had a lot of fun with it. Is, you know, when we do something like vacation Bible school, the only thing that I really care about at the end of the day is making sure that kids are in an environment where they can feel safe and cared about that isn't going to you know, isn't going to harm them in any way. You know, that isn't going to show them a world that, that is, um, that expects something of them or says something about them or their lives that they, that isn't real. And I care about that more than I care about really anything. Because the way we talk about scripture, the way we talk about our faith, is always going to have those complicated, real elements to it. This story, you know, is in scripture, just like the feeding of the five thousand is. Or just like other stories where David dances with joy, right? I mean, that's why we tell those stories kind of back to back. Is that you see David fully being able to understand how devoted he needs to be to God while at the same time being awful. And the fact that you and I are also like that on some level. or at least have the capacity for it, is a, is a really good reminder. But it also is a reminder of that the people in your life who can be wonderful, who can also be unbelievably terrible, that one doesn't justify the other, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make it like all equal. You know, there's this line from a song I like that I preached on a couple weeks ago that this woman was talking about this relationship she had with this person. And she says, you know, with you, I either get Eden or Armageddon. And she loves this person. But with you, it's Eden or Armageddon. And she can't do it anymore. Because she realizes that the toxic traits of Armageddon don't justify the Eden that things are whenever things are going wrong. And so, I, you know, I think that one of the best things we can do, which is why I liked having this past week bump up against this week, is that we have these difficult conversations that we have to have with people. And that we talk about that as being a legit part of life. And my hope is that that kind of feeds into how we can have conversations like this with people that we need to. And um, I think that's a huge part of what it means to be a person of faith. I think it's a huge part of what it means to be um, someone who's sort of trying to navigate the relationship that we have. And I think that the story really speaks to that really personally and really well even if it's not comfortable. But I think what we find over and over again is that scripture is not terribly comfortable because it's very real. And that is important too. 
So those are the things I'm thinking about this week. Um, not, you know, um, not a diff- like an easy topic, but I think one that's really faithful to have a conversation about. So I hope that you're able to kind of dive into that and or see kind of how it speaks to you. See how it moves you, how it makes you feel. Um, what it brings up for you, what you, what questions you have. And then we'll kind of see how it goes. See where I kind of head with it. So that's what I have for this week. Um, I hope that we're having important conversations together. I hope that this series has been something that's been helpful to you. Um, or that if nothing else allows you to like, open yourself up to necessary next steps in life. Um, after this, uh, we start Ephesians, and uh, that's a whole other thing. So, uh, anyway, thanks for doing this. Thanks for listening. Thanks for looking at this. Thanks for just kind of reading through this. Hopefully, you have a wonderful week, and I'll see you next time for another first look. So take care.